partnership we have, it's sort of like a managerial partnership. We give them X amount of dollars, and we get the resources through the graphics department, through the marketing department, that kind of stuff. So it's sort of a give and take, give and take. And it works out great for us. And I don't know that anybody else can work it out because we have such a great work relationship with the college. But we are doing very well with it, and I think you're going to see some things happen. If I know who Tedeschi Truck Spam is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm not a big music guy. I'll tell you that right now. It's never had been. Never had time, really, unless it's radio playing on the way to work. So uh, I found out uh, that we was getting them, and I started looking around and said, wow, that's big. It's a big group. We've got people coming from Washington State. New Mexico. Washington. Huh? New Mexico. New Mexico. Arizona. Uh, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, West Virginia, Virginia, Alabama. We got people traveling that far to see the Pressburg to watch in this venue. Now I gotta tell you about the Mountain Arts Center before we even want y'all to get over here to see it. We just recently put sixty thousand dollars in the sound wall. Just to have, have, just to have <coughs> We have put uh, twenty thousand dollars into a sound board. And they have something back there called a splitter. If anybody knows anything about music, I may be calling it, maybe something else. I don't know. But it's called a splitter, is what I think it's called. Our guys were actually taking, it's got like four consoles. They're taking one console out, taking parts out of it to make the other three work. And then they take two of them out to make two of them work. So we've had their best money. And we've got probably, I'm going to say, $180,000, $200,000 over and above. But we already have a budget for that. <coughs> but it makes a difference. We have groups coming back to our recording studio and recording. As a matter of fact, Chicago, well, the Chicago album that Jill wants. Oh, the songwriter? Uh, yeah. Songwriter the year. Yeah. Song Chicago year. Music Group Association honored one of the ladies that works over there. She works for the college and she helps us over there. Her name's Jill. They are dealing with the uh, Song of the Year, Songwriter of the Year award. She lives down in LA County and you know she works here and, and she's at the Mountain Arts Center. You know where it's recorded at? Turkey Mountain Arts Center. Uh, we've had groups come in, uh, 38 Special, I remember 38 Special. 38 Special had to do a live concert over there. So we're really trying to showcase our culture, our, our just, just our niceness. And that's what it is. It's all about our license and accommodation hospital. I'm going to go ahead and cut off the questions. Okay. You may have a minute to sit. Um, and we're going to. I uh, want to, though, he referenced uh, Samantha in the back uh, a couple of times. That's our uh, Christmasburg Tourism Director. She's standing back there waving. Hey, Dan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 If I could add real quick, she just recently won the Newcomer of the Year for the KTIA. That's the Kentucky Travel Industry Association. And uh, he is also our partner won a couple more awards for them, so that's pretty cool. Right, sorry, go ahead. Right, that's okay. I just wanted to do some housekeeping things and get us moving into the, the next bits of our day. Um, housekeeping things. We have restrooms that are through this door right here. Um, and Wi-Fi is being worked on. It might be up now. Our guest channel might be open for you to be able to get on the Wi-Fi if you needed to do that. If it's not, it's a work in progress, so it, it will be there eventually. We have some coffee, uh, water, and then some like cappuccino kind of thing to take up over there if you're thirsty uh, as we're going through the morning. Um, I think, did everyone have an agenda? Okay, so I won't go through that super in depth. In a few minutes, uh, when I'm done speaking, we'll actually kind of have a little icebreaker to kind of get to know one another a little bit, and then we'll be coming back to this area for a panel this morning with some of our local community members to be able to speak. We will then go to lunch where the people that are sitting on this panel will actually be seated at, at different tables for you to have a chance to talk with them a little bit more in depth if you would like to about what they're working on and what they do and how uh, you might be interested in it or might be wanted, wanting to do something like that back in your community. Um, and then after lunch, we're going to be going into two breakout sessions. And I don't have my thing on. One of them is, is about uh, communicating and, and difficult conversations. And the other one, hey, you're so helpful. You're a good assistant. Uh, one is, is called community reconciliation. And the other is how to, how to find
find what you need to address specific challenges facing your community. So we'll have those two um, breakout sessions in the afternoon. If you haven't decided already which one of those you might want to do, you can kind of be deciding that as we go through the morning. So I think that's all I needed to say for right now. And then I'd like to introduce Betsy Whaley, who's going to come up and kind of move us through our next moment. Thank you. And uh, what Mayor Les was talking about uh, really is what What's Next East Kentucky is about. It's about connecting, it's about celebrating what's good in our region, and it's about collaborating to see what we can build together. Because we can all um, do better together than we can alone. And we're going to have just a minute after lunch to talk a little bit more about What's Next East Kentucky. But this morning, what we want to do is have everybody stand up and get moving. And I want you to find one person that you do not know. And I, I want you to find out these things about them. Their name, what community they're coming from, what's one thing they can celebrate in their community. Whether it's we've got great volunteers, we've got beautiful scenery, we have a lake, what can they celebrate? And what's one challenge that they are facing in their community? You know, young people are leaving, we don't have enough jobs, what's the challenge? And I want you to pay attention because in a minute, your pair is going to find another pair, so the four of you, and you're going to get to introduce your partner to the, the rest of the quartet. So um, stand up, find somebody that you don't know, and get this information. If you need something to write on to remember, there are no books on back page. Too many years being isolated and siloed into our individual counties and communities 
we have to work together. And building this network, uh, What's Next is Kentucky is a bottom-up network. So it's for communities, by communities. And um, we want to help everybody have opportunity to learn and grow and grow together. So um, I just want to call your attention to a couple things. Restrooms <laughs> are in the back. There's a recycling bin up here in the front. Um, and I want to recognize the steering committee members for What's Next in Kentucky that are here. We've got Stacia Carwell with the mayor's office in Prestonsburg. Uh, Dan and Mindy Click, who are with the Grayson Gallery in uh, Grayson, Kentucky. Uh, Robert Donnan with E2C Communities. He lives in Hazard. Um, is that it? And I'm Betsy Whaley with Grayson. We all have little tie-dye things on. If you have a question or need something, holler at one of us and we will try to help you. Uh, and now I'm going to turn it over to Stacia. All right, thank you. Uh, what we would like to do this morning is uh, introduce you to a few of our members of Prestonsburg. And we will give them each uh, a moment to kind of talk about what they're here representing today. And we'll just kind of ask them some questions and have them talk about what they do. And we will make sure to have at the end of this panel just some time for you guys to have some questions. So hopefully we'll get all those questions answered while we're speaking. And then we'll only have a couple at the end and we'll stay on track. Um, I want to introduce, uh, first uh, speaking will be actually the mayor, who you've heard from already, but as, on, as his panel, he will be speaking to a project called CMH23. Uh, on your uh, agenda, it's listed as Keith Casebolt. Um, Keith's not able to be here this morning, and uh, Les has actually been one of the OGs for CMH23. <laughs> he is a board member for CMH23, so he can speak to that. Um, just as well as he can. Next, uh, we will hear from Josh Turner, who is a city council member, um, but he also has been key in our Sugar Camp Mountain Trails and the hiking trails. And so he will be speaking to that this morning. Oh, Sheena Mayer. Sheena has um, a business in town called Lou's Place for Pets, and we all revert to calling her Lou. That Which is my dog. Her dog. <laughs> <laughs> But Sheena Maynard um, has, has a business in town, Loose Place for Pets, but she also is extremely community-oriented into bettering the city of Prestonsburg and working with people in Prestonsburg. And then Heather Owens has a business in town with the Mountain Muse, um, but she is also an artist. She is an artist. She is an animal artist. <laughs> she just looked at me, she's like, I am not. She's an animal artist. She's the animal whisperer. I think that's and more <laughs> and Heather Owens is an artist, and so she's going to speak today um, to her business, but also to the work that she does uh, in the arts. So I'd just like to take a minute, a few minutes, you would each try to keep it to about two to three minutes, to just talk about your project, and then we'll kind of move from there, and I'll have a like, few start with. Real quickly, CMA 23 was a project that was brought to me by Chief Caseflow. Uh, when I first came on board, it took us five years to get it. We are a not-for-profit. And we had an awful time getting that status because the IRS had never seen anything like it. Uh, that's how unique it is. What we're trying to do is we're trying to showcase local talent. We have joined into a partnership with TCN, the Country Network. They're in over 20 million homes across the United States. And they came, they came in first once a year and now twice a year. And they shoot our local talent doing original music. And they play it on this network on Monday nights at 8.30. I'm sorry, Monday nights at 8 o'clock. If, if you don't have an opportunity to watch it, you can go onto the website and watch it, or you can go to, uh, we have a CMH 23 website you can go to. Our goal was to cover the entire region and, and push our music, our culture, and everything out there. And we actually had the intention of setting up our own TV station that we would produce our own show on arts, on ad, animal advocacy, on our mountain bike trails, on the Harlem's Black Bear hunt. Uh, on, you know, our, our five executive board members, there was three of us originally started, our five executive board members were from Harlem. They're from Harlem, Ashland, Pike County, Floyd County, and uh, Perry County. So we're covering the whole region. Uh, our goal is to try to drive people here by using that music to tease them to the website, and the website has a list of events of everything going on there. And then bring them on into town. And not just Prestonburg, but the entire area. Thank you. Josh, go ahead. Uh, well, Sugar Camp was kind of born 
as a volunteer effort. It's mountain bike trails and hiking trails mainly. And uh, basically it was just a local group that we were using mountain bike trails and hiking trails that were here that weren't very good. We just kind of started improving what was already here. And uh, it's been a partnership between the city and the state park. The Corps of Engineers owns the property, the park and the state manages it basically for the Corps of Engineers. So half of our property is on the city and half of it is on the state park. So it's been a partnership effort there. All of our money that we work with now is all through grants, federal grants, uh, a lot of bike specific grants that we've been able to pick up. Uh, it's really taken off. Like Les said, we've got, we don't even know how many miles now. 30, 30 miles, 40, a lot. And uh, people are coming from everywhere to use them. And, but without the volunteer group behind it of mountain bikers and hikers, it, it wouldn't have gotten as far as it has for sure. But, uh, Josh, can you speak to the, the level um, of the trails technically? Like the main the main draw that we have, I mean, there are mountain bike trails all over Kentucky, especially Central Kentucky. There's a big population of mountain bikers. They don't have the technical trails that we have here, and that's the big draw that we have that sets us apart from everybody else. If you put Prestonburg on a map to get anywhere that's comparable to this, you're going to go four hours from Lexington, four hours from Louisville. We get people very regularly from Indianapolis to come to use our trails, from Portsmouth, from Louisville, definitely, everywhere in Kentucky. It's just, it's the closest place for those folks that meets the, the level of technical riding that they want. And I speak mostly as a mountain biker, but hikers come too. Uh, Make sure I understand that when you say technical riding, you're really saying that trails that are a little tough or not, the, not, <coughs> not casual riding right. trails? Right. That do present challenges? Just anybody is not going to be comfortable on them. Right. You know? But we do have some very easy trips. Some. Yeah. We're, work, we're working on more that are easy. <laughs> Josh, I know you said financially that you're basically empowered by grants, is that correct? Yes. What do you see basically what you're offering? Uh, is it a community marketing thing to bring people in to Prestonsburg? Or what could be possibly a way for sustainability for it to be five, ten years down the road? What could possibly be done? You know, I'm not saying we're going to charge everybody for getting on the trails or this and that, but is there some? What's your ulterior motive? Is it used as a marketing tool to get people here to be able to go in the shops to do other things and that, or is it going to be able to be sustainable <coughs> as a entity or a business or what? The, the best thing about it really is it, it costs the city nothing. To, to, to man, to it's it's all volunteer. It, yeah, it costs literally nothing. So. The grant money that we have, we have to set aside projects. And so you know, it's almost you almost have a hard time figuring out where to spend money when you get it. And right now, we're at that pivot point where we're trying to figure out how to capitalize on it. We're, we've got several different ideas. We're people from all over want to do events here, and you're always going to see indirect benefits from it more than direct. That's the you know, that's the problem with outdoor tourism in general. I think is. How do you quantify the benefit? So you it's always going to be indirect, mainly, I think. That you're going to bike see. manufacturers, bike people repairs, things of that nature that could go along with that. And, and yeah, that's to bring nice. business in, and you can have events as far as races, similar to motocross or something like right. that. Right. Okay. And we are, well, we do have that kind of event. This coming year, though, we're going to really step into that, and we're going to be having some, some pretty good events here. We're this is what, our fifth year? Fifth year. Uh, fourth, 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 fifth year, yeah. Is, um, you're talking about technical riding and such. Um, are the trails marked kind of like ski slopes? Like, does it, it's is very clear what they are? There's a national standard, basically, for what a black mountain trail is. Just like a ski slope, basically. And it's, mm -hmm. it's all pretty well understood in the mountain bike community. But that's been one of the biggest problems we've had is making everything easy to understand when you get out there, get everything mapped and signed well where it's not confusing. Because first impression means a lot when people come and word spreads quick in groups, you know, or something like that. When one person comes and they say, well, I was confused the whole time I was out there, then they tell 10 friends and before you know it, you know, you're under. Yeah. Josh, what is 
the experience of building and maintaining these trails over five years and marketing them taught you and the community about how to do this well that you might share <coughs> with other communities that are like if you're thinking if you're thinking about looking at your assets and developing trails, if you want to tell them three things that you would want them to think about at the beginning. What would you say? Definitely have a concrete plan before you get started. Because that was one of the biggest mistakes we made is everybody was just all over the place. And everybody wanted to do something different and it took us a long time to overcome that because it was confusing at first. And I think we're finally at the point now where everybody's kind of on the same page, but you definitely need a plan before you do anything with it. That's my definite takeaway. What about the balance between having a willing crew of volunteers and then having the money to put them to work? Is there a tension there? Can you do a lot with a little, or do you need that investment? It depends on how many volunteers you've got. We do a lot with a little because we have a lot of good volunteers and a lot of people that are willing to help. The prices, if you have to, a lot of people bring in trail building companies. The price to build trail that way, it's all been on the ground. But, I mean, it's outrageous. It's like $10,000 a, a mile or something like that to build trail. I think we build it for maybe hundreds of dollars a mile. But it's all volunteer efforts. Judy, I'm oh, sorry. If I could add to that, uh, Josh is part of the team, and they put in over 100,000 volunteer hours. You figure that out, even the minimum wage, we've got much money in Sacred City. And they go out there and they dig and they cut. And on weekends, you, and by the way, uh, anybody wants to get outdoors, anytime after a nice storm comes through, bring a chainsaw, come see us. <laughs> on Saturday mornings, we're out there. Josh and I, most of the time, and I help when I can. But uh, I, I have to say, the volunteers are what made us where we're at. It could, we couldn't have done it without them. The city initially put in over a two year period, right about $16,000. We have a multi use trail, which is wide enough for us to get ATVs on for emergency purposes and for maintenance purposes. But all of, it's sort of like New Circle is to Lexington. That's where our multi-use is. And everything else sort of goes back and forth through it. And the way they've designed the trail is somewhere on the multi-use, we can get within a quarter of a mile of everywhere on that trail system, which makes it great for EMS or maintenance or whatever. Yeah. So when they got the plan in place and they started acting on their plan, we could ask for them better. Judy asked earlier, uh, Mayor, about connecting the trails in the town. What's what's the biggest challenge in doing that well? Private property and different. And so connecting the dots between, you know, it's probably, as a crow fly, less than a mile, but you have to cross lots of private property. You know, it's just a, it's not something you just jump out there and start on. It's, you know, it has to be a, a lot of planning involved in And you're talking about 600 foot of sand. Yeah. It's, it's hard to get somebody from here to there without being very steep. So we're having to intertwine to a lot of problems. I'm going to go ahead and uh, have us move through so we can make sure everyone gets introduced. And I'm going to have Sheena um, just talk about, Sheena, if you would talk about your business, but also um, how you use your business in the community. I own Lou's Place for Pets, which is a pet grooming, pet boarding and an accessory store, so just think something like PetSmart is what I offer with boarding. Um, years prior to opening my shop, uh, I was into animal rescue, local animal rescue, which is a big issue <coughs> here. I started a community project seven years ago where we sponsored kids for Christmas and we sponsored school supplies and stuff for Christmas. Once the merchants um, <coughs> banded together when we realized we can bounce off of each other and work together, that grew my name and that grew my causes. More people have learned about it. And then it began people calling me saying, hey, I've got a couple of used bikes. Can you find kids for them? Hey, this dog was hit by a car. Where do I go for help? Hey, you know, where I've got extra food for this month. Where can I get it? So the community became involved and it exploded. We, my shop has sponsored no less than 100 kids for Christmas, the three Christmases that we've been open. We put coats outside, we put foods outside. Um, I can take in stray animals in my shop, but as many as I can help, I help and I place and I move on. That, that's a hard thing, you know, it's, it's a supply and demand thing, even though it's a, it's a living creature. 
but giving me a bigger voice has gave me a foundation and a platform to rally the community together and go to list many, many, many times and go to the city council many, many times and say, your community is tired of seeing dogs in cars at Walmart and the temperature being 98 degrees. We need to fix that. You know, there's 40 cats living under an abandoned building. We need to fix that. Your community is tired of seeing dogs chained up with no dog house in 12 degree weather. We have actually, as a city, made such strides in um, animal welfare that there are political leaders, there are city leaders, there are news stations from other states calling me, emailing me, stopping in my shop with just a camera saying, what are you doing and how are you doing this? And my response is simple, like, get tired of it and do something about it. Like, I'm very strong-willed and, you know, I'm very passionate about animals. I mean, I love the fact that my business is successful. I have already expanded once and I'm looking for another building, all within less than three years' time. Um, and that's because the community supports me because I feel like I speak for the community and even if people call me nasty names and, you know, talk about me on Facebook, I don't care. I speak for those that don't have a voice. And, and I'm thankful. Like, I'm not just saying that this list is here. Like, I defend this all the time. The city council and our mayor, when I went to them with an animal issue, it's an animal, most people think. Like, they are on it. They want to know, what is your reason behind it? Send me some facts and let's do it. We are getting ready to modify the state ordinance to where we will have some of the strongest animal laws in the state of Kentucky. No one will be able to beat this. So you're, you're not going to come here and just treat an animal. And I'm really proud of that. And they're always willing, anytime I give them tickets for kids, Les is the first one over at the shop and he says, what can the city do to help these kids? Who can we feed? Who do you need money for? It's kids, it's elderly people, it's special needs people. Like, this community loves helping, you just have to be that voice. And I feel like, more so than a business owner, like, I'm just a voice for people because I'm loud. You know, you can spot me in a crowd easy and, and that's what I like and that's what I enjoy. She's a bully. <laughs> <laughs> Only when he doesn't listen. I'm persistent. <laughs> when you all were doing your um, <coughs> your icebreaker, I, I pulled everyone to the side. I said, like, here's how we're going to run the panel. And Sheena said, I'm sorry, I can't pay attention to you. There's a stray cat in the parking lot. <laughs> so I had to let her know that's someone's cat. It's, uh, it's okay. There's an orange cat out there. Not she can leave it alone. It's healthy and love. So she was able to come back to me, Sheena. <laughs> all right, in that, in businesses, I'd like to move on to Heather. And Heather, if you would talk about your business and what brought you to Prestonsburg, and then you would also speak to how you, um, I lost my word, how you showcase the arts through your business. Um, I'm Heather Owens. I own the Mountain Muse. Um, as Les said, um, I'm originally, well, I'm from a lot of places, but we lived in Hazard. Um, and I taught school for eight years. I taught art. Um, I lost my job. So I freaked out and did what any person, you know, <coughs> going through a quarter life crisis would do. I wiped out my savings and bought a business. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, just so happened, it happened to be in Prestonsburg, and I'm glad I did it. Um, so uh, the Mountain Muse is kind of like a big hodgepodge, like think of the word news. It's what gives you joy. So the things that give me joy is something good to eat. So we have fudge, um, lots of other types of foods. Um, we have uh, vintage stuff. I love vintage clothes, um, vintage items, um, antiques. So we have that. Um, I love weird stuff. So we've got all kinds of t-shirts and gifts and whatnot, and I love art. So um, currently at our store, we have, um, we showcase 30 artists, and they're all local to this area. Um, and I wanted that to be an integral part of my store because um, there isn't a place of, like here, other than the Mount Art Center, that you can walk in and see art for sale. Um, so I wanted it, you could walk into a store and buy a $20 piece of art. Once art is like crack, once you own a piece of art, you want another piece of art. So in making art easily accessible has just 
bloomed. We started off with two artists, me, I paint chickens and possums for a living. There is a big market there. Um, but, um, so, like I said, we started off with two, now we have 30. Um, so, um, getting the art out there and into people's homes is my goal. Um, we have art classes at the store. Um, uh, it's hard for me to host public art classes anymore because people are scheduling private group art classes, which, you know, is great too. As long as people are doing art, appreciating art, it doesn't matter how they're doing it. Um, also, this weekend, we have our first um, art, uh, guest artist coming in and setting up in the shop. And she'll be, uh, her name's Deidre Pfeiffer, and she's from Columbus, Ohio, but she loves Prestonsburg. She's, uh, she comes here probably six times a year just to experience everything that we've got to offer. She loves to shop downtown. She says this is the greatest place ever, and she lives in Columbus, Ohio. So, you know, that says a lot about what we have to offer. Um, so, she's going to come in, set up, paint for several hours, um, have her artwork for sale, and just like chat and talk to people about what she's doing. So, I think that also will help um, bring in, like, oh, well, this is an artist, okay? This is her artwork. Oh my gosh, this is so cute. Oh my gosh, this is affordable. Here's my first piece of art. Um, and um, that's going to go along with that happened before. Because um, like we said earlier, Saturday is a busy day. So this is happening before the story walk and then the Christmas one. I think I covered everything. I don't know. Good. Um, what I'd like to do is when we did, and they've spoken to this in what they talked about, but I wanted to speak directly. When we did our icebreakers, we talked about a one thing to celebrate and one challenge. So I'd like to, um, just as you feel ready to have an answer, and if you don't, that's fine also, just in what you're speaking to today, what challenge did you see in our community, um, or what challenge have you seen in our community that you have addressed through your project or your business? Um, I, have, I have to leave this thing, but I've started with that. My biggest challenge was community involvement. Get everybody buying. Uh, I'll be honest with you, there's still some people who haven't bought in to the fact that tourism is an economy. And well, let's never want to replace coal unless we find a vein of gold or a vein of uh, uranium. We're not going to replace coal. Coal is going to make the comeback. It's going to make the comeback. Not, maybe not as big as it is, but it will make the comeback. <coughs> but we've got to prepare other ways of adding to that economy, not take from it. Like everybody thinks we're trying to do, we're trying to add on to it. And once the community has realized that, look, this may work, it's not cold, but it's an economy, well, then we started getting back from everybody. And these, these are here three very, very, very dedicated advocates for the city of Prestonburg and for what we're trying to do. And I hate to do that. Thank you, Bill. I, I will see y'all at the Mountain Art Center. I've got a presentation on the same way Thank you. Thank you, David. So I guess if you all want to go ahead and... Well, like Les said, I think the biggest difference between Eastern Kentucky and uh, places like Asheville, these mountain towns that, have, that are wildly successful, they never had coal to rely on like we did. We got way too dependent on coal in this area, and we totally ignored what we got to work with. And, you know, the trail stuff, it's just a no-brainer in my opinion. I mean, we've got it here. Why not use it? The biggest thing for me, I mean, I've lived in Prestonsburg aside from college my entire life, and the biggest complaint that folks my age always had is, well, there's nothing to do here. You know, they yeah. want to move to the city, you know, it's, there's nothing to do. So now I think the mentality is a little different in Kentucky because, Lexington is so overcrowded, you can't do anything. Louisville is just about the same way. I think the appeal of small town living is probably better now than it used to be. Uh, you know, broadband plays a big role in that because people can work remotely 
more than they used to be able to. And in the future, that's going to become more of a thing. I think rural living is going to be more appealing than it used to be. And, it, you know, it all starts with quality of life, things like trails and, and that kind of thing. That's just my opinion on that. The biggest challenge that we faced as merchants was the, the public's idea of, well, if I want to shop, I have to go to Lexington. I have to go Huntington. I have to go to a mall. We decided to work together, greet each other, meet each other. We do uh, events like block part. We call them block parties, um, where we just open our doors late and we offer like the kids toys or treats or snacks and music and and we try to entice people to come out and see what we've got. Literally, downtown Prestonsburg has everything, and we have unique gifts. Whether you're buying for a baby, your grandma, your weird cousin, or just if you want a good snack, we've got really good stuff like. I sell a lot of like natural products for your pets that are that are safe and I've been able to help people uh, stop giving their dogs like harmful steroids and medications just by convincing them not to buy a product from me but just saying this is what I offer and this is why and you should do that. And we've brought people in and we've seen well that store is not just an old lady store with pricey stuff I can't afford. It's cheap cool stuff. That's not just an old lady selling furniture in her little belt and her little bonnet. She's got some awesome. <laughs> I pick on her all the time. <laughs> I was trying to think of who he was talking about. I was like, there's somebody else that sells something. <laughs> <laughs> She's got incredible handmade gifts. And our toy stores and our kids, our kids' stores, I say toy stores, they're, kids stores. they're phenomenal. Like, it is a sensory overload, like those ladies have put so much time and effort into their displays and and, and the windows of, of the ladies boutique shops they're incredible but our events brought people downtown and so with money not going to Lexington to Fayette Mall nothing against Lexington and the Fayette Mall but Fayette Mall doesn't cut your kid a fifty dollar check for you know cookies their fundraiser just don't you know people give so we give and, and we're excited for that but working together we've, we've kind of changed that mentality but that's our biggest challenge is keeping people here yeah i think um mostly what sheena said i agree with um when we first opened our businesses everybody was off into their own little corner like oh well they do this and they do this and we hardly even knew each other's names and one day we were like, if this town is going to succeed, we have to A, know each other, B, work very closely together, and C, not copy each other. <coughs> so we all downtown, we have a group of businesses, and we meet monthly. We are in association with each other almost every day of our lives. And, um, we tag and promote each other. Yes. Yeah. So um, it's not. It, it took out the competition. We're no longer in competition with each other. We're there just to build everybody up. And I think in business that's kind of <coughs> unheard of because you're always trying to see who can outdo each other. But we're trying to change that mindset and be like, we're all on the same page. We're all on the same level. Let's build all of us up together. We just did a Black Friday event. I don't know if your towns do that, but we had people standing in line around the blocks. There wasn't parking spaces. <laughs> there in my shop, you know, I've got a smaller shop, but people had to wait outside to come in. So it, it yeah. exploded in just the three years that I've been in. It's crazy. It's like, huge now. Last year was my first Black Friday being open. It's like um, we call it early Black Black Friday, so technically. It's Thursday night, but in Friday, yeah. <laughs> and, um, so, like, uh, last year was my first one being open. The first year, I didn't think anybody would want candy and whatnot because they ate all day. Apparently, mm -hmm. people don't eat, they shop. So, um, I had probably 15 people outside waiting for me last year. This year, I had 75. Like, I opened the door, and they come in and circled, or they did a big giant G inside the store. We each gave away uh, gifts crazy. to like the first 50 people. <coughs> we were out in like 30 minutes. Yes. I mean, working together is going to help us. Which speaks to um, something that the mayor said earlier in his welcome, and then also through CMH 23 is is stopping, and Betsy even mentioned it, and stopping the thoughts of 
this is what I do. I gotta outdo what you do so that I can do. And really, um, something the mayor says all the time is, if you're gonna do well, that's only gonna make me do well. Right. So if um, for us and locally, if the Paintsville does well, that will spill over into Prestonsburg doing well. So we are going to uplift Paintsville and make sure we promote the thing that they are doing because it's only better right. for the whole area. Right. Wait. Do you have a thing to add? I just wanted to ask a question. Yeah, go ahead. What was the catalyst that got the collaboration started? So you guys are talking a lot about the partnerships and stuff, but what really got you guys to get Because I think that's where the problem might lie in some of the other communities was actually somebody taking the initiative. That's what it was. It was more of us going around and be like, so we need to meet, we need to do something, let's plan a party. So our first big, like, um, hoorah. hoorah was a block party. Okay. And, you know, if you're going to throw a party, everybody's going to work together. Did you have any resistance? Um, People, I mean, even the business owners, we were skeptical, but it's like, what are you really out just staying open a couple more there, hours? The worst thing that can happen is, you don't do it again. You, you know, you don't really make enough money and then just don't do it again. It exploded. It was. For me, I made more of my first block party than I probably did my first full week of business. It was a huge success, and we immediately the next day were receiving messages, are you willing to do another? Within a 24-hour period, they wanted more, they wanted it again, they wanted a date. The community asked for it. How much did you do for your block party? Facebook. Facebook, and we printed out some flyers. How much in advance did you do? Month? Maybe, maybe. You can't plan things too far ahead. Right. Like people get tired, you know, they'll get tired of looking about it. Yeah. Well, another big thing that we started doing to promote our businesses, and the difference was not they was doing live videos. Instead of just posting, I have a new flavor food, I have a new dog treat. We were literally doing a live video, and then I would join on to Heather's and comment, and when I would comment, you know, people would start commenting, and she would join on to mine and like it and share it, and live videos make a huge difference. So once you did the block party, did you feel like the collaboration within the business community was there and it was strengthened? Is that when you guys kind of built the partnership from the block party? I'm just trying to get like maybe a catalyst point. Oh yeah, you know, when everybody realized that it was a success, together. everybody was on board and realized what we had. Right. Then we started seeing other cities copy it, like Liz said before. So when other cities were doing it, we knew we had nailed it. Okay. So, <coughs> awesome. It's been great. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it all started from, you know, hey, let's do an event, get people to come downtown. And then, you know, we all just kind of banded together and be like, we got to stick together. And in order for us not to squabble back and forth, we have to play nice. And this is how we're going to play nice. Yeah. Okay. And you're just not the cool club if you're mean with us. Oh. We don't want <laughs> to be mean. You're a third of mean girls. We got you said Lester and said she's bullish. She's taking it. Sandy, you want to say anything? I did just want to add, I don't want to put your relevance on you, go to planned out. Um, so, one, it, it is super unique, and if you guys have time throughout, definitely talk to them about the, the merchant group that they have, because it's, I've never seen it work as well anywhere else, but I do want to add all except one to two businesses downtown, all are ran by women. So that's just another layer of, of one, I think, how impressive it is that they work together, and also the, the state of our entrepreneurship right now in, time, in town, all but one to two businesses are <coughs> female ran operated and that networking group as well. I think it's just another layer to add on. That's why it works so well. There was a lot of skepticism about that. And I want to say too, from an outsider um, looking at the merchants network, I, I didn't from an outsider, I never saw pushback. I maybe saw there's some ambivalence. Some businesses just aren't interested. Which um, they've done well to continue to include them. Um, they may not be open, but they've always done well to continue to promote them and to advertise for them and to speak on them. Um, and they just they don't participate in some of the extra events, and that's just fine. Um, but they have done a lot as a merchant center. And I'll add before we see if the or go on. Uh, we recently rebranded our merchants uh, group. So if you want to follow us on Facebook, it's uh, Shop Prestonsburg. 
So we're no longer the Prestonsburg Merchants Network. That seemed a little like um, too businessy. Business so now we're just Shop Prestonsburg. And so we're going to do like an exclusive event post from that, exclusive new stuff, new posts from that page, like you'll get the first from that. But, and that's, it's not just one person over it, like multiple business owners can go in. Everybody has the same concept, share everybody. I guess that kind of, oh, go ahead. I, I've got one other question, uh, you know, the sharing and things like this. I've been affiliated with business organizations for a long time traveling uh, and various things that I've done. How do you keep it fresh? I know that I'm getting on it right here a little bit. How long have you been in existence? Two and a half years, almost okay. three years. So the biggest thing that I've seen in a lot of communities is they all have a business association, but it kind of peters out. How do you keep that energy going? How do you keep that freshness going? I mean, a lot of them do seasonal type things or whatever, but what do you think is the success? I know the unity of you all promoting each other and things, but how are you going to keep that fresh and how are you going to keep it up there? Name change, I think, is a great idea, you know, because it be able to do that. But, and how do you measure that success? How is an event you consider a success for you, for the businesses themselves? I mean, do you do couponing and numbering to work? How do you actually measure that success other than, say, traffic flow? As long as people come out and have a good time, we're successful. As long as we pay our bills at the end of the month, we're successful. I know Heather travels a lot. I travel a lot. I do rescue. I do transports all the time. I just got back from Pittsburgh for a grooming expo where I learned a lot of cool things about the business. But while I was there, I made the initiative to go downtown. And even though it was like 15 degrees and I could barely feel my feet, I looked at their downtown and I seen what they were doing. You know, when, when I go to Ohio, I do the same thing. If I go to Michigan, if I go to Florida for something, I go to their downtown and I see what they're doing. And I come back and I say, this is what they, they're doing. How can we do that here? And she does the same thing. She sees a cool idea. We just build on it. We don't just copy, you know, everything is a copy of something. But we build on it. And, I mean, this, this is how we feed our families. We have to stay on it, and that's just part of it. But as long as the community is coming out and they want us to continue, we're more than willing to do it because it's, it's honestly, it's not work, it's fun. When we have our monthly meetings, we bring food and snacks, and, and I mean, we just talk and laugh, and sometimes I'll bring a, you know, I'll just slip a hedgehog out of my pocket and pass around for people to see, like. I guess what I'm getting at is, it. okay, you all just did Black Friday, right? What did that do to your business? Was it a 30% increase in a normal sale compared to the previous year? From the year before, years? my numbers tripled. Okay. In one year's time. Good. So, yeah. But because <coughs> that's going to be big for some of the other communities knowing that, hey, if they're going to go out and promote this, we might get a 20% lift, you see, or by doing that. And I know someone approaching to me as being in an association, the first thing they ask is, what's it going to benefit me? And if they realize by being a part of the association, you might get a 20% bump in your, you know, your sales, which is going to be an effect of your gross profit as well. So. Well, but like for the late <coughs> years and that, whatever you want to call that's been going on for what, five or six years now? So, and it's only increased every year. And so I think that's something unique for Prestonsburg. Uh, you know, like after you eat Thanksgiving dinner, you, you want to go out. I mean, and all the merchants, they, they support it and they complement each other. So I think it's important to understand that, that that's been going on. I think five or six years now, I can't. Maybe longer. Well, maybe yeah. longer. I know the kids' know. stories did it long before. Yeah, yeah. Of course yeah. Did it. And so I think that that's important to realize that it, it's something unique for Preston's for uh, other small towns probably do it now too. But it has to take the commitment of the business owner too because they thought to be willing to and I want to speak shop. too to what Sheena said um, and I, I find this in other um, where, where money's involved a lot of times it is there are those people that are but well, what's what's the bottom line how do I how, where am I going to get my money and I think one of the big catalysts of this group is there are several members of it there are some that are they're making a business they need to make their money this is what's important and there are several members in the group who um, also see the the benefit, the uh, revenue 
that's in just emotion. The community emotion, the community feeling. And so like Sheena said, um, if they're coming out and they're having a good time and I've paid my bills, then this was successful. And so not everyone can afford to think that way. Not everyone can do that and move <coughs> into that motion. But if you have, um, I think, several key people who also see the benefit of just the community being enhanced, yeah, which, which we know if the community's happy, they're going to make money. And they're going to make more money and they're going to triple their sales. Um, but they, they don't care about that in the beginnings. And it's seeing that community benefit and that community um, heart revenue that, that makes that really do well. And One of the biggest examples, not to interrupt her, go ahead. We have two children's stores that are literally one store apart. Now, as, as, someone, as a woman who doesn't have children, I could look at those stores before and be like, they have the same, they have the same stuff. But the difference between uh, those two ladies is if you walk in one store, she'll direct you to the other one. Be like, oh, do you have this brand? I'm looking for this. They don't say, oh, no, well, I'll order it. I'll, I'll scramble and find it. We send each other to other people's shops, and that's something that other cities need to take note on. Uh, we're working on wrap cards and maps and all kinds of things, so we can literally say, if you don't like what I have to wear, check out this chick. She's got some cool stuff. Or if you're hungry and you don't want my stuff, go here. Or, like, we, we promote each other, and it's, We've done it for so long now; it just slips out of my mouth. Like there, there's no competition anymore. It's it a, it's a whole, it's a mindset. It's a mental thing. Like, you know, as I, like, I taught school, so business I don't have any uh, education on. But teaching school, you've got to uh, kids have to work together. They have to be in that same room all day to to actually learn something. So the <coughs> town is no different. Like we had to learn each other and work with each other in order to do better. And I think, um, you know, if we have an event or something and we all normally close at 6 o'clock in the evening, if we're open at 8 o'clock and there's two people in our store, that's a success. Because there's two people in your store after your normal closing hours. So you got to just get like that. And Stacia, you might know this, but how many new businesses have I been in downtown Prescott? I don't know. The one I haven't been to, the, like the wedding, I haven't been to that. I don't know, we've had a few more open that we've just talked about. The poverty, the income, I mean, what, four or five in the last six months? In the last six months, we probably had about six businesses yeah, open so um, in downtown proper and then kind of as you move yeah, further out. Yeah, down here. So, um, so, I mean, it's obviously working. They want to be a part of the association and the trail towns <laughs> and that's what I wanted to kind of move on you guys uh, touched on a little bit um, next steps you have talked about working on some rat cards and then direct one another and your uh, block parties as you're working forward Josh would you start and talk about making next steps that you see for sugar country uh, well like I touched on earlier we're looking at the link <coughs> to the downtown and when you link a trail system to downtown it opens the gates to a lot more grant money you know, everybody's heard the trail town. We don't, we don't have that certification yet. We're working toward that. You have to have trails connected to town, really, to make that viable. But uh, that's obviously something we're looking at. Um, we've got a lot of different directions we're trying to go. We're going to have more events. We're going to have a show of service that we're trying. We're pushing. I was talking to Samantha about this earlier. We're pushing for somebody to step up locally and run a shuttle service, that's a big deal in the mountain bike thing where you shuttle people at the top of the hill, they can only bring they only have to bring one vehicle. Mm -hmm. And so we've got a lot of ideas, it's just a matter of yeah. acting on so it moves into the yeah. the volunteer thing and you kind of run. We the know we know it's a stuff. success at this point. It's just a matter of where we go from here. So. Alright, well um, in that are there any other um, questions that you have for those that are up here and also if you have any questions about CMH 23 I guess as the mayor left I just want to touch back on CMH 23. CMH 23 kind of parallels what's next East Kentucky in a lot of ways. Um, go ahead. Yes, Real quickly I think you touched on this video the, uh, the old joke is they roll the sidewalks up at five o'clock. Uh, is Preston Perk still a, in the downtown business specifically or picking up to the, well, I call the right? Uh, 
Is the 9 5 town? Is there any possibility of being a new to 9 kind of town? There are several businesses. Like the pottery place is only open in the afternoons after school. Um, we have, yeah, we have uh, Kicking Ash, which is a, a bake store. They're open until 9 10 o'clock. Uh, we are regularly open past hours. She does the string art class and things like that. And where I board animals and stuff, like I'm, I'm literally in there for like 14 hours every day. So if somebody calls or, or knocks or whatever, like I just go and lock my door. It's that simple. Or if you want to give me your money, just because I'm hiding in the back eating chips and salsa, that I'm not. I'm going to come up front and open the door. I'm pretty much available all the time. So, and that's with every business. I've closed. And wanted to go over and buy something. I call her all the time. I'm like, if you got a bag full, I'm gonna come here and go over and buy that. Like, so every business is really good about staying home. If you call, everybody pretty much is willing. If I randomly drive through downtown Prestonburg at 7:30 on Wednesday night, and I would say, hey, you all this cool stuff, or everything closed. It depends. Yeah. Uh, Wednesday is probably uh, a lot of <coughs> and a lot of places are closed due to churches. Like, you know, you got churches. Um, but um, definitely Fridays and Saturdays. Oh okay, yeah, okay. but you know, like me and Gina, we're always at. That's why we had to move to Crestonburg because I couldn't drive back and forth to Hazard every night at like midnight. I was getting real tired. But um, like last night, we had a uh, one of our meetings, and um, we come back. I come back to the store, and it was like eight o'clock, and the people at the door. Like, you know, like looking in, and so I looked on lots, and they had like their own little personal shopping experience. So, you know, we all, we all live close, and, you know, we can easily go over the door. I'm not on the panel, but I did want to speak up on Tori and Samantha. But our downtown merchants are flexible, they're phenomenal. Like, they're always there to help us. Like, we bring motor coaches in, and it's not on their itinerary to shop. But I'll call Heather literally five minutes before close and be like, hey, they want to come in here. And I mean, I'm bringing 50 people. Right. And I'm like, is it cool if we come in? And sometimes they don't buy. Maybe one or two people buy something. And sometimes the whole bus goes ham on her and buys every Wicked Chicken t-shirt she's got in the store, you know? But that's the one thing that I will say. Uh, when I started tours with me and Kathy, kind of started doing the small business bring it down and it's been a phenomenal thing to watch me and Catherine about this one first came in today that we had so much small business stuff when we first started we were like take more take more and this year there was hardly enough there wasn't enough to go around for all the businesses because I think that's why they've seen the growth is that they're flexible and they have each other's backs and like Sheena I mean they're willing to get down and dirty you know, that's another thing like our mayor. He's willing to get down and dirty. It's not, oh, I, I work behind a desk. You know, he's, he, I don't clock out. Like, Les doesn't clock out. You know, our, our paddle fest event, he's in the river with us 8.30 in the morning on every four Saturday, May through September. And then he's leaving us with a chainsaw loaded in the back of his truck to go out on the trails and cut trees. You that's what it takes. Everybody here leads by example. I think that's the big thing. Is everybody here lead by example? They're not going to do. They're not going to ask you to do something that they're not willing to do. And it's a work in progress too. To 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 more to your question, um, you will find a lot of shops closed in the in the evening hours, in the later hours. Um, but that's they've addressed that in the ways of having their block parties and having their special events to really encourage people to be open. And that's part of what I think has had our businesses even be more flexible in the evenings because they benefited. And they've seen that people were, were interested in coming out in the evenings. So I think that is a work in progress for, for you to be able to drive downtown and see all the shops open at 7 o'clock in the evening. Um, isn't necessarily something you would see, but it's been moving towards that. Oh, I had a thing I was going to say. Oh, I do want to make um, uh, that thing I was going to say. What was that? <laughs> CMH 23, thank you so much. Uh, CMH 23 is really working to make it, so we have so much, what started with was the musical talent. We have so much musical talent. I bet everyone in here can either sing or play an instrument or know someone who can sing or play an instrument amazingly. And, and one of the first thoughts for CMH 23 was to make sure 
to try to make it so there was an outlet um, for musicians who are amazing to not have to go to Nashville, to stay home and be discovered. If you look along the Country Music Highway, CMA, the Country Music Highway 23, that's where, we, that's where it got its name from, US 23, you have all of these music superstars that came from along this highway. And we have the easiest and first state to um, But, you know, Billy Ray Cyrus came from along, located along this eastern Kentucky corridor. And so the start of that was music and to get them heard and to get them seen nationally without having to move away from home. But then also wanting to pull in tourism and wanting to make it so you have somewhere you can go to. If you go to cmh23.com, you can go to events and you can find mountain biking events and where they're occurring, if they're in Harlem, if they're in Prestonsburg, and you can kind of plan yourself accordingly. And so as they are working, they're, they're wanting to work with um, tourism agencies around Eastern Kentucky to just fill in that information so that we're all working together and you have a spot you can go to and find information. And that is similarly in the way that What's Next East Kentucky is working. We have all of these community individuals and community groups that have been just fighting it along by themselves for so long. And this is a group all together, a community of Eastern Kentucky. And so when we say, I need to work on getting trail town certification, well, we know through the What's Next East Kentucky network that this city is working on or just received their trail town certification, and now we can go and talk to them about how they did that. And that's just getting us to become one large neighborhood instead of all of our little individual neighborhood cities and counties. And so that's really the big um, push for what's next East Kentucky. Are there, um, I want to say, oh, he's, Frankie's still here. Frankie? Frankie? I just wanted to point out, I'm sorry, I know you didn't see this coming. Um, but Frank is the owner of Made to Crave, and speaking of local vendors, our lunch, when we break in a few minutes, our lunch will be provided by Made to Crave, and Frank is actually the owner, creator of uh, Made to Crave. This is not a chain restaurant, this is not a business that came in from out of town, this is someone who lives in town and has opened a restaurant that has got delicious food that you'll find out in a minute. And I just wanted to introduce Frankie for that. Sorry, Frankie, that was... Oh, sorry, Selena, I'm just standing there, I didn't even notice. Sorry, I didn't even realize that was you. Oh my gosh. Frankie and Selena are the owners and creators of it. But, but this is another way um, that we have local community members that have started a business that's been supported by a business. Their um, church helped them open that business up in the beginning. They had church members in there helping serve food as they hired other people, and they've become caterers. In, in advance. So thank you all so much for lunch. I just wanted to recognize them before we, before we wrap up for lunch. Are there are there um, any other questions you have for the panelists that are up here? And also if you have questions about CMH23, um, I would be willing to answer them. Somebody else says I will. <laughs> <laughs> if you would describe the bike community, uh, even the cost of some of the, per, the, the, the bikes themselves, but maybe some of the habits that your out-of-town bike enthusiasts have? It's, uh, honestly, I always tell people it's, it's more popular with people from out of this area than it is local. Okay. You, see more, you see more people from out-of-town on the trails than you do local people. And that's starting to change. You know, it's a cultural thing. It appeals to a certain type of people, and it's young people that have this love of kind of people that are this. It's expensive. It's, you know, entry point for, for some of these bikes, it's, I'm going to sound insane when I say this, five to ten thousand dollars. These are not the Walmart mountain bikes, yeah. It, it appeals to a demographic of, of young people that have this love of And those are the kind of people that travel and spend money when they travel. Where do they eat when they're here? Uh, made a great, great example. We're Lizzie B. Lizzie B. Is like probably the go to place. They all like craft beer. Uh -huh. They all like small, they don't want chain restaurants. You know, they're not going to Harvey's when they're coming here. They're going to the local, get them on the local flavor. The more local, the better, right? Yes. Yeah. And, uh, I will say, too, I don't have a $5,000 uh, bike. Also, you're not going to catch me on a bike on one of those trails because I would kill myself. <laughs> But they're also very um, accommodating to hiking and for walking and for you know casual uh, travel. The mayor actually um, on Sundays in good weather 
almost every Sunday afternoon for a, for a long time. Just direct the people out on a hike. Or you could be crazy and run the trails with his wife. She would run the trails. And he would just do kind of a nice general hike. And he did it beautifully hiked down the mountain where there was a shuttle that brought us all back up to the park. That's my kind of hiking. Um, so they are accessible to the person who is not a hardcore mountain biker. But they're also very enticing to the person that's a hardcore mountain biker. Because those guys, they're insane. And there's some really cool, I've just seen the video of the trails and what they do on those trails and the work they do on those trails. It's fantastic. And pretty amazing. CMH 23, uh, without comment or observation, who mm. operates the Country Music Highway Museum in Johnson County? Um, that Paint is the Paint the city's Paint the yeah. Thank you. Can I just make one comment about the, the biking? Um, Mesa did some research a couple of years ago, and one thing we learned when we were looking at trail towns and that sort of thing is that people who will come in to use your bike trails spend more money. Um, kayakers, walkers, hikers spend less money. But people who come in to ride a rails to trail or do mountain biking are going to spend more money. Because generally they have more money to spend and often they're staying overnight. So uh, if you're thinking about developing trails, that's something to keep in mind. Our trails are also dog friendly. I well, know I would be the only one to mention that. <laughs> but uh, Les, Les, Les adopted a dog. It was a stray dog that a city council member picked up and fostered forever. Um, he takes Tucker walking all the time. I know because I have to dig dirt as Tucker's paws, much as Tucker's dismay. I back him up under that. But uh, they're dog friendly too, which is really cool. And the conservation. The conservation district put out uh, poop bags oh, yeah. and trash cans and stuff, which is really important. People are very adamant about it when they are empty. You hear the town hears about it. Yeah. Also, an interesting thing is, and I think it was partly with the conservation district, uh, they had a couple guys, or forestry, they uh, came in and they, they figured out what trees are along our trails. And we haven't got them up yet, but we actually have labels, and we're going to be labeling a lot of the trees along the trails. So as you're walking through, you can see some of the trees as you're walking and looking. So that's some of the... the it allows you to classify the trail as interpretive nature trails, and then it, it again gives you access to more grants. Also great. I thought it was just cool and interesting. Also, it makes money. So, you know, those are little things that you can do that, that we, didn't, we paid for the sign for the little place that we've got in, and that was not a lot of money, and the Forest Service came in and determined <coughs> what those trees are, and they're gonna come back and help to make sure those, those labels are put on the correct trees. Yes, sir. you start for the time? No. Uh, I, I think we're going to break for lunch, but I would like to just take a minute and give a thank you to our panel. <laughs> When we break for lunch, you'll notice that um, I think all of the tables have a label on them. If you see, just so kind of walk through the tables on your way to food. And if you see a topic that you'd be interested in having a discussion about, um, if they can stay, our panel members will also be sitting at some of those tables. But it's just a place for us to foster some um, topic driven conversations. If you're not certain, you can just pick a table. I think, do we have a blank table still, Robert? Uh, I think it's the one in the back. I think all the way to the head of the table, we... Did you put the flip chart? Oh, we've got all the... Mm -hmm. See, I told you, I'm four holes flip charts. Put all the So if there's one of these tables that you're interested in, and if you just don't know, or if you would just like to have lunch, you can sit at that back table that doesn't have a label, and you're welcome to do that as well. So again, I feel like you just keep being the dead horse, but I do want to remind you the bathrooms are back, back here in case you've forgotten. But um, at this time, we will go ahead and break for lunch.